this is a very nice representation of the replication. So here you have your DNA polymerase. You have something in the middle here that is opening up the DNA. What is that? Helicase. So look what happens here. See, this is a single binding protein right there, stabilizing the naked DNA. There you go. When it reaches the piece that is already synthesized, it doesn't need to synthesize anymore. Now it has to go to the other end and start synthesizing again. So when you reach the other Ogazaki fragment, the clamp dissociates. And remember, once the clamp dissociates, the DNA polymerase will come off too because it has low affinity to the DNA. It's not going to be stuck there forever. Clamp is what keeps it in place. DNA polymerase temporarily releases there. See, that's the DNA helicase right there, unwinding. The primase becomes activated and synthesizes a short RNA primer on the growing lagging strand. Okay, so that's your RNA primer, like five to ten bases long. The As DNA polymerase binds to the DNA again and becomes locked in by the clamp. There you go. Actually, the sequence here is a bit inverted. The clamp goes in first, brings the DNA polymerase, but you get the picture. Now it dissociates. Now it will find a new primer over there. It's going to grab onto it again and pushing the string inside again to make the DNA in what should be the opposite direction. The yes. So like the other one has to keep on grabbing to the new strand and it has to keep, keep on synthesizing backwards, sort of. So, yeah, it has to grab and release and grab and release just to keep pace with the other one. But they work at the same speed. Both the DNA leading strand and the lagging strand are working at the same speed. The primer is the loader attached to the primer. Okay. Okay, so this is just repeating what we just talked about. Three, five prime to three prime direction. And yes, this happens in a bi-directional way. It's going in the two sides, not only in one side. So every time that you have a replication bubble here with your tetra replication on the prokaryotes, remember only one origin of replication. And this fork, it will go one fork to one side, another fork to the other side. Yes, also keep in mind that when you have this clamp loading and the clamp you know, coming in and going off, you don't only have just one protein that is working all the time. You have a pool of proteins working in there. So you have a continuous replenishment of the stuff that can grab on or let it go. And then you know what the Okazaki fragments are and the lagging strand. Those are the pieces that are made up of RNA and DNA. Now what do you think is going to happen next? You have replicated DNA, you have your leading strand that is nice and replicated. Only at the beginning it has the little RNA over there, but oh, it shouldn't be a big problem. And then you have a lagging strand that is totally fragmented with DNA and RNA in between. Now you know when the DNA gets replicated, it does not come out with a parental strand and the newly synthesized being fragmented DNA RNA. It has to be, the whole thing has to be DNA. That's why you're faithfully replicating your DNA. So now what happens? Yes, you have to have another polymerase that comes in. That's in the prokaryotes, DNA polymerase one. That's going to come in there, recognize where these primers are, cut them out, and replace them with DNA. Now remember that this replacing is going to be done on the five prime to three prime direction. Now, okay. C is for clue, that's okay with me. Very important here, DNA polymerase one recognizes RNA, degrades it, replaces it with DNA in one step. 
Kick South RNA, puts in DNA. Kick South RNA, puts in DNA. That's the job of polymerase one. And then at the ends, it happens that you have a little nick made, which you, I have other um, illustration here that is more obvious. But at that very end of the synthesis between one Okazaki fragment and the next, you cannot add a base from the outside that is coming as a tri triphosphate. triphosphate. You only have the base that is ahead of it. And the DNA polymerase one cannot use a base that does not have those pyrophosphate leaving groups because it needs energy. So what happens, it just gives up. It drops that synthesis. It knows it put all the nucleotides it possibly could. So it leaves a little nick in there. So what happens at that side, you have this DNA ligase protein that will come in there and it still needs energy is going to use some form of energy to seal up those nicks. Which form of energy do you think is going to use? OK, when you think about energy in the cell, you think about? ATP. Yes, it's going to use ATP. Oh, the group that leaves is two phosphate groups together. That's called a pyrophosphate. pyrophosphate. Yes, two so phosphates, the, DNA, the, the energy from. The energy from. Yes, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of energy to replicate all this DNA. Okay, so now, it's proofreading mechanisms. Avoid mistakes. You may think that DNA polymerase will make a lot of uh, errors, but not a lot of errors are introduced when you are making new DNA, otherwise you have a total mutation for every generation. So the polymerase has to have a form that will check itself. DNA they are <coughs> now look at this shape of this DNA polymerase, this subunit here of DNA polymerase. Which <coughs> subunit is there that is putting on the DNA? D is for glue, that's okay with me. <laughs> subunit that is synthesizing the new DNA? Yeah. Alpha? <laughs> yes. Subunit of DNA polymerase 3 is the alpha. And then the subunit that recognizes the mistake is the epsilon, and it needs a little push from the theta. So here you are synthesizing the DNA, now let's say this DNA polymerase is going to make a mistake here. Here's DNA chain elongation generally pauses. This pause allows spontaneous melting of the end of the DNA strand being synthesized. Look at this, look at this, how cool. With the mismatched phase to enter a 3' exonuclease site on the DNA polymerase. This picture is very important to have in your head. Remember when we were talking about the structure of DNA? that is a straight structure, that you don't have this DNA that is zigzagged with these bases that are pyrimidine and pyrimidine is going to be skinny, and then two, what are the other ones? Purines? The big ones? Two rings, right? Pugachu? If you put two purines in there, you're going to have a very fat part of the DNA, yeah. two pyrimidines, very skinny, and then you're going to have something that will look like that. So that doesn't happen. The DNA, you have a purine and a pyrimidine that get together, and then a purine and a pyrimidine that get together, and it keeps on going. So you have this nicely shaped double helix that comes out of it. Now polymerase knows about that, and he wants to keep it like that. When you get this strange base that attached here, it's going to say, oh, I have a purine and another purine here. That doesn't look right. It recognize the shape of this DNA, and something wrong with those hydrogen bonds that just doesn't feel right. It doesn't see anything, really. It cannot see anything. It has to go by feeling. It's feeling and then comes here, oh, this is wrong. I back up a little bit. Let me correct the mistake. When it backs up a little bit because it felt something wrong, to correct the mistake, to push this wrong nucleotide into this little pocket, it will push into the epsilon subunit. And now inside that place, this is going to cut out that mistake. It's usually not just one. So in order for this to get into the pocket, you need to have a little train track of nucleotide that is going to be in there. So it's just going to cut whatever gets in there, including the one that is wrong. But then it's going to liberate the polymerase to keep on going. And it will just resynthesize the whole thing again without the mistake this time, hopefully. So additional nucleotides would actually be removed. How do we remove the three prime to five prime direction? DNA polymerase can then resume its synthesis activity. 
calculate in the five prime to three prime direction. The proofreading function reduces the overall error rate to as low as about one in a hundred million for DNA polymerase three. C is for clue, that's okay with me. Okay, now, this is a nice, very important question too. Why is preventing these mutations such an important thing? Well, because if you keep on mutating, you're gonna die. <coughs> or worse, you can develop cancer. Okay, so in order to prevent either of these two bad things to happen, you just correct the synthesis. Now we're gonna go into the eukaryotic replication, DNA replication. It's basically the same thing, it's the same idea as the prokaryotic replication, but you give different names to the polymerases because they are a little more sophisticated than the bacterial system. But you just have to remember that instead of calling them one, two, three, whatever numbers, oh, that's another thing. Prokaryotes will have about five DNA polymerases. You just have to remember the most important one, which is the three, and then the one that kicks out the RNA, which is the one. Okay, one and three. Now, with the eukaryotes, you have about 13 different polymerases. Okay. You just have to remember the most important ones, just the same way as with the prokaryotes, because we don't even know the functions of all of them, and some of them are just speculative. So here we have, what are the differences between the prokaryotic DNA replication and then the eukaryotic DNA replication? In the bacteria, you have a singular circular DNA. Now, with the eukaryotes, you're going to have linear DNA. You don't have the circular DNA anymore. Now, with the bacteria, let's think about, for example, not the bacteria, but let's think about the powerhouse of the cell, mitochondria. Yeah. How many genes in the mitochondria? Maybe like about 35 or so. Bases, about um, 3,500, 35,000 bases, relatively small. Now, if you look at the number of bases for the human or for the eukaryotic DNA, you have a huge amount of bases here to be replicated. So now you start thinking, how are you going to do this? If you're going to do the replication the same way that you do a prokaryotic replication, you're gonna take forever. The cell will never be able to replicate in a lifetime. And that cannot happen because life will just stop to <coughs> exist for the eukaryotes. So one way that the eukaryotes found to solve this problem is by having multiple origins of replication. This is very important difference between the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes replication. Prokaryotes, remember, only one ORC. Eukaryotes, many, many, many origins of replication. You think, picture in your head, a zipper, a very, very long zipper. If you want to separate this whole zipper and you grab the middle and you pull it out, you're gonna be pulling from the middle and then you pull from the side, pull, 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 and you go to the other side and pull and pull and pull. It's gonna take you, let's say, five minutes. Now, if you grab this whole zipper and you put five friends around, okay, one grabs a little place and you say, go, and everybody pulls at once. You unwind, you know, separate the zipper in less than a second. So the strategy for the eukaryotes to have a fast replication is to have many, many origins of replication. Another idea here, besides the zipper, is that if you have, remember when I mentioned about the uh, textbooks and if you use a font 10 and you put all the bases uh, corresponding to each letter on these books, you're gonna have about uh, 1,200 books in the room. That's the amount of DNA you have in one cell. So now let's imagine that you are going to replicate one chromosome, this, let's say it's equivalent to one book. How is it you wanna do it? Well, you, can, you have two options. Either you can seed it and rewrite it yourself which is gonna take probably about a year. Or you can have 30 people rewriting one chapter of that book. That's gonna be maybe about a month. So you can just cut the time of this replication in a lot of factors if you have a lot of origins for that replication. One question that is also important to keep in mind, you have to picture the DNA, picture it in your head. And you think, if I have so many origins of replication, how does the polymerase know when it reaches the site that the other polymerase already did the job? Otherwise, you can just replicate it again 
and then you have two replications and three replications and get a big mess in there. He has to figure out a way to communicate with the next part of the DNA that is already replicated. And the way that it works is that first you, can, you have to have this polymerase that's going to recognize an origin of replication. He has to come in there and say, okay, I'm going to start here. So the signal or the sequence of the DNA here that is the origin of replication for the eukaryote is called the origin recognition complex. This complex is made up of the DNA sequence and proteins that interact with specifically with that sequence. So now we have special proteins here at this origin of replication. So now polymerase comes in there and recognizes this and opens up the DNA there. Once it recognizes and opens up the DNA there, it will kick out all the proteins that were attached to that piece of DNA. Now, when it starts to kick out these proteins, it's going to also kick out these proteins here that on the parental strand are interacting, but then on the newly synthesizing strand, these proteins are not interacting anymore. Okay, so now these proteins here are called MCM proteins. Just remember MCM, they interact with the parent strand of DNA. Once they are kicked out, you have the, the polymerase is going to make new strand of DNA. Now, before you have the cell division, these MCM proteins are not going to come back and interact with the double strand of DNA anymore. It is going, only going to be allowed to interact again with the DNA when you have your new cell already made. Okay, there is some system over there that is going to prevent these proteins from interacting again with the DNA. So this is a way that the cell has to check how to not duplicate the thing that was already duplicated. He recognizes the parental strand, DNA polymerase gets there, starts to replicate the DNA. Once it starts to replicate, kicks out all these interacting proteins, so the new DNA doesn't have these interacting proteins. Now, if another polymerase comes in and recognizes the origin for that replication, which, you remember, is a piece of DNA, it's a sequence of DNA, it is not going to start replicating again mm -hmm. because it does not have those proteins that are interacting at that site, at that origin site.